guys, what's up? It's Kyle Murphy, and you're listening to uh, Down in the Valley with Appeal. Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Edson Ochoa, and uh, for Down in the Valley with the Peel 2005. Joining me is uh, Dynamo Theory writer Carson Merck. Carson, how are you doing? Not too bad, man. It's a, it's a beautiful Saturday afternoon in Vegas. See, that's awesome. Yeah, it's about the, it's about the same thing here uh, here in McAllen. So yeah, I'm just pretty much uh, visiting, you know, the family for a little bit. Um, you know, the valley. I don't want to get too homesick, you know. But uh, but yeah. So today, you know, we have the our last. Um, South Texas Derby against uh, San Antonio. Uh, we're going to be away once again, and uh, so what can you what can you tell us about it? What, can, what have you heard? And are they sending any uh, Dynamo players uh, to RGB? What What have you heard, Carson? Yeah, I haven't heard any uh, anything directly. Uh, if any of the, the Dynamo first teamers are going to go down there, um, when I did talk to a couple of Toros players this week, I know they're all. Uh, I'm, they're they're sad the season's ending, but there's not really a better way to end a season without going to the playoffs rather than beating you know your rival on on the road too, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I know the guys are pumped up. Um, they're pretty pretty set on uh, obviously San Antonio is still going to make the playoffs, but uh, from what I know, there's still some seeding that can be maneuvered. I don't think it's going to be too drastic, but um, I think winning that the South Texas Derby again, you know, as they did last year, is definitely you know a consolation prize for not making the playoffs. Yeah, and and more than anything, like you know, we mentioned it before, it's the that uh that momentum heading out to to the uh, to the off season, and uh, honestly, you know, try, just trying to keep on playing uh, spoiler against San Antonio because they really want to to get up higher uh, in in the standings, and we can ruin that ruin that for them in their in their stadium. You know, it, it, it's I guess you can say the best uh, uh, of what we have, pretty much. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, there's no question. We'd rather be going to the playoffs, but you know, you can take what you can get. Obviously, that last last match between the two clubs was was pretty freaking intense from from the get go. A lot of uh, physical play. There was the red card where the guy clearly kicked Escalante in the back of the head. Uh, they said he didn't kick Escalante in the back of the head. It was uh, it was definitely a, an emotionally charged match, and I would have to assume we will see quite a bit more of that this evening. Yeah, ex- exactly. The only thing, I mean, it was it was a really good game. Um, from from the from what I was able to see from that uh, San Antonio game, uh, I just felt that uh, for most of the game, uh, San Antonio was you know just charging at, at the Toros, and uh, you know if it hadn't been for for Cali Brown, you know I think it would have been the score would have been much much different. Uh, but I mean, kudos you know as well for. Uh, for the team to being able to hang on uh, to the lead over there, especially in such a hostile environment that is uh, San Antonio. I know uh, I was uh, talking to a friend of mine, a member of the Stampede, who had gone to the uh, to the game over there, and uh, I know. I mean, for the most part, the uh, the the supporters group there. I'm not sure. I'm not sure which one it was. He didn't tell me. Uh, they were they were getting kind of kind of rowdy, you know, to one of the f- uh, families that were there to go see the 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 game, and they had a you know Toro shirt shirts on, and uh, I know I know for a fact that you know they were trying to they were, as soon as uh, right before the Escalante's goal, the uh, I believe it was uh, two ten Alliance they were they were chanting you know anti RGVFC. Uh, chance so i think that just that was just that was just perfect that when they were trying to mess with us you know we we scored we scored on them and just got got them to be quiet you know but um other other than that you know after that game against uh san antonio i believe that that was when uh, we played against uh, phoenix and you were there actually you were there actually uh that is correct right yeah i think you're, i think that, i want to say the san antonio match was couple matches before that i know they played swope somewhere in between and then um yeah i was actually i was at the match last week uh, out in phoenix it's, it's a nice stadium it's an interesting stadium they, they call it a pop-up stadium and that's exactly what it is there is it almost is like a fairground 
and then um, there's really nothing. It's like gravel, and then this nice stadium's right there in the middle. And so, yeah, I was able to um, get out there. I, I think I, when I talked to Junior Gonzalez, I told him it's nice to you know, be able to see DDA drive by in person. At some point in your life, check that off the, the bucket list. But <laughs> unfortunately, the match didn't, didn't go as well, but I don't know, it wasn't too bad. So, Could have so- been worse. So what 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 did you what did you get out of uh, out of that game you know uh, since you were you were there in person how did you see you know the the players the players moving you know and and anything that that came out of that you know I know you mentioned yeah. in your article about uh, Emilio Garcia that he was playing really well uh, up uh, as a as attacking yeah he was good he uh, Emilio was great um, he was he was aggressive. Offensively and defensively, he was able to, to stop them from getting out on a couple of counterattacks. Uh, Lucatero looked well as, um, in addition to Garcia. One thing that was interesting, and I think I mentioned in my article, and, and I'm eager to see how it goes tonight, um, being that they are playing spoiler, being that there's not anything to lose at this point, whether you lose 2-0 or, or 5-0, it, it doesn't matter. You're not losing playoff position or anything like that. Uh, in that Phoenix match, it was interesting. They didn't really go there was never really they don't let shots go and it's kind of plagued them all year Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of times they'll get into that attacking third and it's oh you want passing but it's one too many passes and it's almost more of a passive attack than it is okay somebody just let the shot go that's where you miss guys like Mames and uh, when Escalante is not there um, you miss guys like that that are just willing to say okay if I put shots on goal there's a chance we score. If you never shoot, you're never going to score. So that was uh, one thing I took away from that match. Um, I I think they just they just seemed kind of overpowered, and uh, Phoenix was doing definitely more of the um, attacking throughout the game. The second goal just it sucked. Um, Cali initially stops Drogba's free kick and then lets it go, and, and just it rolls right into the goal. And actually, a uh, funny thing was after the match. Uh, Cali, when he was walking through the tunnel to go back to the locker room, actually threw his. It wasn't an anger, but he definitely a little frustrated. He threw his goalie gloves into the uh, into the crowd for for a lucky fan. But I think he he figured if if he wasn't able to stop that goal, I don't think he wanted to use those gloves anyway. So that was uh, it. Was interesting, a little um, ceremonial uh, goodbye to those gloves after a, definitely what you would describe as an easy goal, I mm-hmm. guess, or a soft goal. I mean, I, I don't blame that, that he feels kind of disappoint, disappointed with himself. But, I mean, like I, I told you on Twitter, you know, even the best uh, make mistakes every now and then. And uh, just because of that mistake, I'm not going to, or anybody, I don't think anybody should say like, oh, well, he's not a good keeper or, or anything like that. I think he is one of the ones that has proven, you know, time and time again, whenever he uh, comes down uh, with RGV to play, that he he's one of the, he's one of the best you know around uh you know let's not let's not go much further than that san antonio game like i mentioned if it hadn't been for him you know it you know it, we would have gotten a, dis- a different result um now what do you think or how big of an influence you mentioned that rgvfc was kind of timid against uh phoenix rising but how much of an effect was having a player like jason johnson in front of you uh, somebody who was, you know, running circles around, I got, I got to say, running circles around Justin Bilyeu, and that his goal in the 34th minute was just a prime example of that. Uh, yeah, they, they were kind of complacent because I, I'm guessing they thought that the ball had gone out of bounds, you know, but, you know, you, you got to keep on playing until the, the referee says otherwise. Yeah, I think having a guy like Johnson and then obviously uh, Drogba and then even Sean Wright Phillips in the second half, I think that plays into it a little bit, um, not wanting to maybe push numbers forward as far as the attack because you don't want to get beat on the counter. Um, it was more so the complacency of just not shooting when you're there. If if I have a shot from the edge of the box, mm-hmm. that's you know not a great shot, but you know I, I've scored from here before in my career. I've never scored from there in my career. But with that, um, it, it's it's a decision of. Do I take this shot and give myself a chance to score, and then maybe somebody off a rebound, or do I cycle the ball back around, whether it's passing it back to the midfielder or out to the wing, um, where they can either try to send a cross in and 
then and you just keep doing this this pattern. It's almost a circling pattern of, of never actually putting a shot on goal, and then you know one clumsy pass and it's going the other way anyway. So mm-hmm. um, it's just a matter of playing, you know, confident in yourself. And you almost, if you go back to that San Antonio match, like you said, they were holding on um, that whole match. They were they were up a man and they were the, they were on the ropes. It wasn't San Antonio that has ten men and that we're just you know it's a barrage of shots. We were on our back foot, and we were up a man, which is not something you often see, um, which yeah. I think almost kind of plays into that of, you know, put a shot on goal. You you need to establish yourself as a dominant team. Last year's team, they possessed the ball, and they wore you out. They took their shots when they had them, Mames, Escalante, uh, Zenin Kadic, um, you know, Luna at that, at that point as well. Um, when you have the shots, take them. Otherwise, you, when you're not scoring, you're giving the other team a chance to score if you're not holding possession, which this team has not done this year. Yeah, I mean, I, f- I feel like, for example, I think the one that tries the most to take the shots has got to be Escalante. Uh, I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's especially that, that goal against uh, San Antonio. I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure if he was trying to cross or if, uh, if he uh, was uh, actually trying to shoot there, but, you know, Got to give him give him the benefit of the doubt, you know, trying to find that that uh, that that corner, you know, and obviously the the, the goalkeeper just wasn't expecting it. So uh, you got there's got to be the other, especially I think that like uh, players like Eric Bird, like uh, like Emilio when he has the chance, you know, to uh, to, to play Luca Taro as well, you know, they they have to come up and uh, try to take the shot. I mean. It's like they say, you'll miss a hundred percent of the shots you you don't take. I mean, I know I know Kyle Murphy. You know, he he's a forward and he's he's scored a lot a, a lot of goals uh, with us. So I mean, that's that's a given that he you know he's at least uh, trying to uh, t- take shots you know in order to score. But I just feel like the rest of the midfielders they have to step up and uh, you know give give it a, give it a try. In, because if you try, you're trying to play, you know, possession based, you know, and they catch you too far up the field, then you know it, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, suffering, you know, especially against teams that have uh, really quick wingers or or really quick uh, players, you know, you know, just just in general. Yeah, there's a lot of positive things that come from shooting the ball and being aggressive and confident offensively. Mm-hmm. Like I said, you know, you take a shot. Can score, which is always always a beautiful thing. There's a there's a rebound opportunity. You know the shot can deflect off a defender right to you know another attacking player who can who can score. Um, it's just having the confidence and having the assertiveness to shoot is a big thing. Emilio does a pretty decent job of it. Mm-hmm. Um, Bird was more aggressive. I know he's playing more of a holding uh, midfield role at this point. He was more aggressive shooting the ball last year, and he hasn't been this year. Uh, he scored a couple really big goals last year. If you remember, yes. um, as a substitute, he would come on and score these, you know, second half equalizers, second half go ahead goals. So I maybe he, you know, feels inspired in, in the San Antonio match, and then um, even going back to you know the opening match when Kyle Murphy had an absolute shot on a tee against San Antonio this year and completely botched it. Uh, obviously, he's done well since. But I'm wondering if it will be in the back of his mind. Okay, I didn't score against them the first time. Didn't score against them the second time. Maybe this time, I'll, you know, I'm high five in that. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, uh, what do you, what do you, how do you think will should the Toros? I'm trying to find the the perfect words to say it. How do you think that the Toros should should uh, should play? In in uh, in in San Antonio, so just all all guns blazing, pretty much. You, I mean, you did mention you did mention that you know there's they have nothing left to lose anymore, but uh, yeah, should, should they just would, risk would, it all? I would I would say seventy five percent guns blazing because you don't want to um, completely you know play with reckless abandon and just you know throw numbers forward and you know play crazy because then you're going to get beat. San Antonio. As much as I hate to admit it, they're a top team in the Western Conference for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, if you play carelessly, they're going to beat you, and they're going to beat you pretty soundly. Um, what I'm hoping they do, play aggressively. When you get the chance, let the shots go. 
hopefully you see Luca Terrell play again tonight. Um, he's able to create some chances for for himself and other people. Uh, I'm just hoping that they play aggressive. Like 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 you said, you have nothing to lose. Um, if you go out there and play to a you know nil nil draw, it, it's not gonna you know make you feel any better. It's not gonna make you know San Antonio is not gonna be too concerned with that. So just just play, um, play aggressive, go forward, but you know do that with enough, you know, caution and, you know, calm play that is not going to just get you smoked on the back end. So um, I'm hoping that I'm hoping they come out and just, you know, go out on a good note. Obviously, it's the end of the season. Um, you're playing for not only you know, your, yourself, your future, playing for the city, um, playing for junior, playing for everyone. So, uh, you know, go forward, play well. I'll, I'll predict that. I'll go three two. I think there was a three two match last year. I was Lovejoy scored in Minota. So I'll go three two Toros this year. Three two tonight. I don't I don't know who scores those three, but um I will go I'll go three two. Uh, I think my uh my prediction for this game, I'm going to say that it's going to be two one. Two one. Um that I just I just feel that um, the defense is going to step up, and yeah, they're probably gonna let one let one let one in because we know what kind of firepower uh, San Antonio FC has. Uh, but I feel that that our attackers, our forwards, are gonna especially Kyle Murphy will come out inspired, you know, to because. It's going to hurt if they lose uh, against San Antonio, you know, bragging rights and, and things like that. And, you know, even though these players aren't, um, for the most part, they aren't from the region, I feel like a lot of the, a lot of these players have already, you know, formed a special bond with the, re- uh, with, with the fans, with the city. So they know that if they lose, it's going to hurt the fans. So it hurts them as well. So that's, that's what I hope. And so I hope that, that the two, the two won and they can, they come with the, with the victory from over there. And, yeah, yeah, and like you said, I think even though a lot of them aren't from there, um, judging just by how physical and how um, you know that that match was, it was intense. That last match between the two, and there was a lot of temper flaring. So I think even just looking at that, you can see that this match means something to them. Obviously, in the sense of you know pride for the for the club and for the area. Yeah. Um... My question, my question is, um, okay, so Escalante is not going to be available, correct? This is for tonight. My guess would be no. Uh, I know he was in China um, with the Honduras U twenty three. I think it was mm-hmm. um, Honduras U twenty three team. So my my guess is he won't be available. But I've I've certainly been surprised before um, with the, with the lineup that they tried out there. So my guess is no, but I'm hopeful. Well, hopefully. Um, so San Antonio, uh, this uh, uh, what was it? The eleventh, uh, I believe that was on Wednesday, correct? Uh, they they beat Portland Timbers two at home. Um, scores the the goals were Ever Guzman, uh, who is an ex Liga MX player, uh, forward, uh, scored in the sixteenth minute, and then we had a. Uh, Tiloma for Portland Timbers 2 found the equalizer on the, in the 35th minute. And then uh, Rochandel found the, found the game-winning goal at the 71st minute. And uh, Like I said, that was, uh, that was at home uh, in San Antonio. And they're going to be closing the, their regular season uh, at home as well against us. So let's hope that, that we, do, we do get the win. Now, I do want to ask you, Carson. Um, so now that, that the... Uh, the season is coming to an end after analyzing, you know, how the team has played uh, most. Well, let's just say how inconsistent the team was uh, throughout the season. What do you think should be fixed? uh, Looking forward to uh, to next season. What kind of players do you think that the Taurus should, uh, should add to the lineup? Um, Should, uh, they try different tactics, or what? What do you What do you think? Uh, who has analyzed the the games more? Yeah, a word that I used a lot on the show is identity. I think that's going to be the key going forward. Um, last year, there was zero matches 
that you turned on for the Toros, even losses, that you didn't know they were a possession-based team. Mm -hmm. Every time they were out there, they were moving the ball around. They were, you know, making the other other team adjust defensively and move around. Um, It's important, I think, in the offseason and then in the preseason next year, figure out what the team is. If You know, it's like they say, you know, trying to fit a, you know, round circle into a square peg. You can't make a team a possession-based team if you don't have the players to do so. If you don't have Charlie Ward, you can't pretend like you have a Charlie Ward. You have to realize you have a Todd Wharton. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if it's exactly needing new players because there's talent there. They lost a lot of talent, but there's talent on this team. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, utilizing that talent and figuring out exactly, you know, what's going to be the, what's going to be the approach, who is going to be, you know, in certain positions. So to me, it's going to be more about that than it is about, you know, going out and completely overhauling the roster. Um, you're also going to have the opportunity to see if, you know, there are different uh, players from the Dynamo. Hopefully, my personal hope, as, you know, some of our friends of mine, I hope all those guys that signed from the Toros last year stay with Houston. Mm-hmm. Maybe they don't all. Maybe some of them come back to the Valley. Who knows? Um, so to me, it's just going to be about establishing yourself, establishing an identity. You know, I don't. To me, I don't care about playing an overly aggressive, fun style to watch. If you play quality soccer and you go out and you win games and you get results, I don't care if you you know score one goal. There was uh, 2015, I believe, Rochester was one of the lowest scoring offensive teams, but they gave up the least goals ever in the USL and they won the USL Cup. That mm-hmm. I, I'm certain. I don't speak for everyone in the Valley, but. I'm certain the USL Cup is fine as long as they don't score, you know, 10 goals a game. Um, so it's just going to be about, you know, establishing identity. I do think Junior is the coach, um, you know, to do that. There were rough patches this year, and I think he'll be the first to admit that. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he he's a great coach. I mean, he comes from a good lineage. So I'm, I'm confident in him. I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, when I talk to him after the, the match on Saturday, we're, we're looking at, to catch up a little bit after the season, and I can – you know, pick his brain because, you know, it, it's interesting to be in a position where he's at where you're the coach, but there is a lot that you don't control. He doesn't control the players he has available. He controls who's – when when they are there, he controls what they do. But as far as, you know, the roster, he doesn't control that. The Dynamo control that. So mm-hmm. um, he's in an interesting position, so I'm curious to hear some of his insight. Um, and, you know, kind of pick his brain on, you know, moving forward, what might be the move. But yeah, I think, you know, establish an identity, make sure you're a team that, you know, you have something that is yours, whether it's a counterattacking team, whether it's a, you know, possession-based team. Because if you look, Wilmer Cabrera last year with the Toros, possession-based, 100%. Look at the Dynamo, not incredibly possession-based. They rarely win the possession battle. Mm-hmm. They're more of a counterattacking team. So it's, it's about adjusting to who you have and who's on your roster, not exactly of trying to fit players to a system. It's fit system to your players, if that makes sense. No, that, that makes that makes perfect sense. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the uh, Meet the meet the Team Night at, uh, at Houston for the Dynamo. And so I caught up with a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, ex-Toros players that, that are over there. You know, Taylor Hunter, you know, Charlie Ward, uh, George Malky. Uh, I saw Mams there as well. He still had he still had the poor guy. He st- he still has the brace from that uh, injury he got against San Antonio, and uh, so I was I was talking with one of them, and uh, we mentioned we did mention that uh, that whole uh, Wilmer Cabrera thing, and that how easily Coach Cabrera you know he adapts his tactics to the kind of players he has around him. We did we did notice that he did mention to me you know that um, you know last year with the Toros how they were very very possession based, and they felt and I'm not sure if they told uh, somebody told this to you as well. Uh, I think uh, I think you know who who I'm uh, talking about, but he mentioned that uh, if they had the stadium last year, like he felt like they would they would they would have not have lost a, a game because the the wider pitch would have been so much more beneficial to to their uh to their tactics to their to their possession based tactics and uh they, they would have been you know the the team to beat if they were already the team to beat you know playing in a practice field you know how how powerful would they have been you know with uh HB park and uh another one of the things that i also got out, out of that was um 
because he did he did play against uh, Cruz Azul at the uh, at the Charities Cup match, and so I talked to him after that. You know, I mentioned to him, hey, well, you know, how you you had a great game. You know, well, how did how did you feel about it? And one of the things he kind of mentioned was, you know, like he felt that he felt very rusty. He felt very rusty playing there, and he got into the groove, you know, later on in that in that match, you know, but just that thing where a player feels like he's f- feeling rusty that he's losing some you know some of his skills from the lack of play time you know it 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 begs me it puts puts me to think and i mentioned i did mention to it in the video that i did upload uh earlier in the week you know i mean having rgvfc you know it's a perfect opportunity to send down you know players that you that aren't able to get you know consistent minutes in, in the Dynamo first team, and yet you take you take these players from RGV because they played well. You take them because you want to give them a you know a first uh, first team uh, contract, and you know you're not going to be able to play them, but yet you don't send them down to the valley so that they can uh, consistently you know uh, get the minutes probably you know. Uh, refine some some things you know so that way when you're able to use them in the in the uh, first team let's say for example you know charities cup or the open cup you know they're 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 able to to get on the roll uh with with, with play time you know and, and it's just i don't see that happening with the dynamo this season another thing that i have noticed and i'm pretty sure that you, that you've noticed it as well carson is that last year if i'm not mistaken correct me if i'm wrong Last year, the Dynamo would uh, notify like about two days in advance which Dynamo players were going to go da- down to RGVFC to play. This year, we don't even know. We don't know until the official lineup for the game is is uh, is posted about like about an uh, an hour or half an hour before the game actually starts, and so. You have no idea, and I'm pretty sure that you know Coach Gonzalez has no idea who's gonna be who's gonna he's gonna have to end up using, you know, for for that uh, for that week's game. I I don't know if, like I said, I don't know if um, I'm correct or not, but I feel like that has that was something that that was on my mind as well. And until recently, you know, starting when I started analyzing, that's when it it kind of clicked. You know, that difference between how the Dynamo has you know used. RGVFC last year, uh, you know, trying to find players, and now that they found the players, it takes them and kind of leaves RGVFC, uh, you know, uh, un, uh, neglected, you know, for a while. At least that's at least that's why I feel, uh, because yeah, it, it it almost ends up being a catch twenty two, unfortunately, with sending the players down. So, um, like you said, there's there's certainly players that don't play consistently for the Dynamo. That's that's obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, but the issue you have is, so you can send a player down like Escalante who, you know, scores goals, does this. But then you also, even in that San Antonio match, you have to look. You send Mames down because he's not playing with the Dynamo and he gets hurt. Mm-hmm. You send um, Tyler Derrick down last year. He was coming back from, you know, red card suspension, I think, and then also an injury. He gets hurt. He's done for the year. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's almost an issue of, yes, you want to play them, but do I want to risk them being hurt for the long term or rusty in the short term? Which I, I can see both sides of it. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the, the better players that play down with the Toros, the more Dynamo players, the better. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely it sucks from a club standpoint because you know Mames was having a pretty promising year, and um, by all indications, he's done for for a little while um, with the knee injury. But yeah, it's a it sucks, uh, and, and I and I've lived this growing up because of, I. Grew up right around the Akron Arrows, which um, you know, touchy subject, but they were in the Indians uh, minor league team. So I, you would get fall in love with these players, whether it was you know Francisco Lindor. I even saw CC Bathia pitch for the Arrows back in the day, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you fall in love with these guys. They're really good, and then they're gone. Um, it sucks, but you know that's that's kind of the way the, the cookie crumbles, unfortunately. Yep, and I guess that's one of, that's one of the downfalls of having a, a pretty much uh, I guess you can say if you want to put it colloquially a farm team uh, for the Houston Dynamo so um, uh, Carson uh, is there anything else oh uh, before actually uh, I actually do want to talk I don't know if you read you know the uh, 
the article or the interview that was uh, that was uh, posted where they interviewed the monitor interviewed um, Bert Garcia. But uh, I did. So what are you, what are your thought what are your thoughts uh, about it? What uh, about his uh, interview? I I would say he almost Bert Garcia and the club in general is almost in a similar position. Like I said with Junior Gonzalez, they're not really. It's not an independent team in the sense of they control the rosters, they control this, they control that. They control the business side, surely, mm -hmm. uh, promotions and all that. Um, I know there's you know some frustration from their side, obviously, as you can see in those articles about attendance. Um, you know, getting the word out there, and, and you know more about that than I do. Mm -hmm. um, but he's almost in, in, a, in a tough situation of he's trying to sell this team where there's never been a team before that doesn't have a constant roster and doesn't have a constant, you know, presence, really. Um, you have players like, you know, uh, Victor Garza's from, from down in that area, um, Omar Antiveros is down in that area. Um, so you have players like that, but you, you know, Charlie Ward's from England. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not from the valley. Um, so you, it, it's tough to, you know, pitch this team sometimes, and it's tough as a fan to support this team at times. Um, I I feel for Bert, and, and I actually I spoke with him, and, and I told him, you know, he he he's doing what he can. I mean, he's trying to he's trying to get fans there. Obviously, they have the uh, the Liga MX friendly coming up, um, so that's that's exciting. That's another. A um, way to kind of drum up interest and drum up awareness. Like I think, I think it was you that even told me there are people who don't even know the stadium exists, yes. which is remarkable because that is, to me, the best stadium in the USL. I know um, Sebastian Biaga of San Antonio FC argued, but um, to me, you know, it, it's a it's a crown jewel of the USL, and people don't even know in that city or in that area don't even know that it exists. So mm -hmm. to me, it's it's tough. Um, he's trying to get awareness out there, obviously. You know, it, it, it's the second year. Um, it's not going to be a perfect formula or perfect system. Uh, as long as he keeps working and, you know, he's in that area. So he, he wants to see that succeed. He wants to see the Viper succeed. Um, so as long as they keep working and they keep trying to improve the, the process and the system, um, I think it'll, it'll be a positive thing. But it was definitely interesting. And it's also, just as a fan of sports in general, having a president of your team that's that candid and that open – is nothing but good. Um, a lot of times, those those people don't make themselves accessible mm -hmm. to the media or to fans or to anybody. Um, you're hearing quotes from a team spokesman. We hear that all the time across sports. Uh, the statement through the team spokesman is, you know, he said this. Well, I didn't hear him say this. And not only does Bert Garcia do that at original interview, he follows up with that Facebook Live, which again, you know, he's trying to be transparent. He's trying to make sure he's getting what his messages out to the fans and you know I, i'm hopeful i'm confident the team's going to continually improve not only on the field but also improve you know on the business side of things and, and I'm, I'm hopeful for that yeah the same, same here i mean uh i i guess i'm gonna be honest i guess sometimes the you know fanatism kind of uh has blinded me on how hard uh bird garcia has uh has worked is working uh, to get the the Toros brand out there in the valley, and uh, like I, I like I mean like I did mention uh, I mean two weeks ago I was down here, and uh, so I went to my to my old job, and I was wearing my Toro shirt, and uh, while I was talking to one of my ex coworkers, so this customer comes up and he, he you know he asked me like oh like well, I like your shirt you know what's you know what you know what team is it. And so I told him that this was, you know, this was the the local team, you know, our GVSC Toros, and like, like, oh really? Like he didn't even know they existed, and he, I mean, he asked me, yeah, where they played. I'm like, yeah, they play at H E B Park, you know. He like, wait, what? And I told him, yeah, well, do you remember where uh, Super Splash was? You know, oh yeah. He's like, yeah, and Raul Longoria and uh, Freddie Gonzalez. And so he's like, oh really? Like, like man, that, that's that's awesome. We already have we already have a team now. So I told him, yeah, well, you know, and tickets start, you know, five dollars, you know. So and there's actually a game uh, going on uh, today. I told him that that day. So like, you're more than welcome to go. Like he said, you're going to take your family and I'm going to have some, uh, some fun for a while, you know. Uh, so you, so you can you can enjoy you know such a beautiful stadium that you know that was barely that has already op that opened the beginning of of, of this uh, this season, which was in in March. You know, so 
there are two things two things there you know the fact that we're in the second year uh, and uh, people still don't know that the, that the Toros exist uh, as well as well as the stadium so I mean I understand and I did post it on you know on the video that you know that probably their their ma their marketing budget is kind of on the low side you know but you know it just goes to say that you know there's a lot of more work to be done on the marketing side if we have people that live right in the city where the stadium is that don't know about the about the existence and I feel you know as uh, for an up and coming you know team or any business for that matter you know marketing is pretty much uh, do or, uh, a do or die because if not a lot of people know about you so you don't get you don't get sales or you don't get you know customers coming coming in you know so your your uh, your investment you're never you're never or it's gonna take a, uh, a long time to 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 break to break even on on your investment so I feel uh, that um, that RGVSC front office uh, you know has got to analyze you know what they what they have been doing have the results you know actually come and I know that I know that Bert Garcia mentioned like that he f he feels disappointed uh, in uh, about the fact that we haven't sold out sold out the stadium uh, so that, I mean that's that so that's a good that's a good sign that they're not taking it like oh well you know our way or we're only we're only going to be doing it our way like even if it even even if you see the results aren't there and they come and say oh well everything's going on great and, and things like that so i mean that i thought that was a that was a, fr a fresh breath air that they're looking at the situation they're looking they're listening to the uh feedback you know from um of people on social media um from the the podcasts that you know that are there people that have a voice or that you know, are look are looking for ways to to make the team better because they're they're kind of falling in, in love with the team at least the ones that are there consistently. Now you gotta work you gotta work on the you know the the first time you know the first timers that go there trying to see it. They, it's like like I posted, you you try to check out check out the game, and then you you go and you, you have uh, you know you start seeing that they're not they're they're losing, so those uh, those casual fans you know you you lose them. So uh, obviously that's all on the dynamo, you know. But the, there's all you also have to take that into consideration. Why maybe people aren't aren't going to the game? It's just that like it's like I I said as well because he mentioned something about you know the have the experiences of going to the game, halftime shows, and things like that. You know that's one of the things where I differed from him when I said you know last time I checked when you bu when you buy a ticket to go to a soccer game, you're going to you you're going you want to go see the product on the field, and if your product on the field is not is not a uh, is not giving you results, then that's putting people off, and people are saying, you know, well, not even even if it's five dollars, you know, it's not worth going to watch the game because you know they're not winning. They're not winning. Simple as that. Uh, we tend to be here in the valley. We tend to be very um, uh, supportive of you know of winning teams, and as well, it doesn't help out that a lot of these uh, a lot of us here in the valley we already have you know uh, teams that we root for in Liga MX in the Premier League. And they're very, very reluctant. If people here are very reluctant to support an MLS team, you know it's gonna be it's gonna be harder for them to support a, a Division Two uh, team. So I mean that's that's what I that's what I see at that's what I see out of it. And uh, so ho hopefully uh, during this off season they start analyzing things. And I mean, I'll say I said it before and I said it again. Like we are more than welcome if they want. We are more than welcome to 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 voice and any uh, suggestions uh, if if they if they want to take take any suggestions or any feedback, you know we were more than welcome to talk with uh, with Bert Garcia or anybody in uh, Toro's front office that is looking for some suggestions on how to help the team because we want to see this team grow. We we love this team, and uh, through through the good and bad. Yes, we might criticize. You know, a lot of this, well, it's mostly uh, talking about you know about myself. I may criticize you know a lot of these things that have been going on you know in this in uh, this past season, uh, but we do it because we want to see this team grow. We don't want this team to disappear. We don't want another RGV Grandes. We don't want another RGV Toros, and that's uh, that's why a lot of people are, have been very cautious as well. 
uh, with the the history of uh, soccer of professional soccer teams here in the valley how they have not they have not lasted and you know so they're very uh, they're they're very cautious and trying to love a team for them to like all of a sudden in the in the next season oh they're gone all of a sudden they announce oh like the the franchise is moving to another to another place or they they fold it completely so um, like I said we're more than welcome to be uh, to be part of this uh, growing process for the R- RG- RGB Toros because I mean they represent the valley we represent the valley and we want a team that 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 represents it well so yeah uh, and, I, and i think there's there's no person that wants the team to succeed and also to represent the valley more than burger Garcia, which is great mm-hmm. um, you have you know owners all across sports that don't either live in the area they own a team or you know live in an area or even are from an area that they you know are in the front office for you know he's from down there so he mm-hmm. wants that team to succeed um, he wanted to be real Grand Valley's team. What sucks, um, and it's nobody's fault, is that the team is, is no good this year and how good they were last year and that they couldn't play in H-E-B Park last year because it's difficult to sell fans on, hey, it's our inaugural season, come out to a match. Oh, where do you play? Well, funny you ask, we play at a practice field. Not very exciting. Um, I know the crowds were decent there last year, mm-hmm. but you know, it's practice field. Yeah. In, in hindsight, it would have been beautiful if you could say, hey, we're second in the Western Conference. We play at this brand new field. It, it's beautiful. Come out, check out the stadium, check out our really good team. Uh, and then that, you know, would have, I think, built it a little quicker. In essence, I look at it as this is almost the first year. It's the first year of HEB Park. It's yeah. kind of the first year of the team. So hopefully, you know, they're going to, like you said, analyze the process. Um, I trust Burke Garcia. Like you said, I have a pretty good relationship with him and the club. If anyone has any suggestions, they can always reach out to you, tweet it, tweet at us, at, you know, down in the valley. You know, send me an email, comment on my articles on Dynamo Theory, um, and I can always pass those along because he's not going to, like you said, say, oh, you have a good idea on how to drive fans? No, it's not our idea. We're not going to use it. Yeah, I, I think he'll do anything that's reasonable, you know, to get people into the seats and, you know, come on and check out the team. So, uh, yeah, any suggestions, never hesitate to reach out to, to some of us. Sure, we're we're very we're more than welcome that uh, to pass it to pass it on to them, because like I mentioned, you know we want to see this this team grow both on uh, the business side, as well as the uh, you know the soccer side, you know what's the product uh, on the field. So hopefully as well the Dynamo you know takes a hard look at this, because you know it's not very it doesn't work for them to have you know a, uh, even though it's a developmental team. To have uh, not have any more players in order to bring up bring up to the team, uh, we had a really really good uh, uh, generation last year. This year, you have you do have some talent, uh, but it's not the same as last year. And what a developmental team is, you know, to consistently bring you players that maybe uh, first team quality or or bench quality for 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 MLS. And if uh, you have uh, players that are playing in the USL that are struggling. You know what makes them think that they'll they'll be good enough for you know to 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 bring up to to MLS. So hopefully you know the the Dynamo starts assessing it as hey you know what you know we should start you know scouting uh, you know as well you know to have to bring in players to RGV we can develop them there and then so so that way that hopefully that they'll be MLS ready for when Rico uh, uh, retires. Vicente Sanchez retires, uh, or uh, or Demarcus Beasley retires. I mean, we already have uh, D- Dylan Remick that's you know up and coming uh, to take uh, Demarcus Beasley's spot, you know. But who is going to be below Dylan Remick? So that is where RGB FC comes in. I mean, we have Justin Billu. We got to have somebody that that'll be behind you know Justin Justin Billu. So you gotta that that conveyor belt has to has to be consistent. So, uh, consistently uh, bringing up players and so the, the dynamo ha- has to you know has to has to look at it as well and so that way they can bring in quality quality players so so we can uh, not only develop for dynamo but also be competitive in usl because we don't want to be uh s2 we don't want to be t2 we don't want to be um 
Vancouver's Wide Caps Tour or Toronto too. We want to be a team like uh, Reno 1868. We want to be like Real Monarchs. Yes, they're also farm teams for uh, for uh, the San Jose Earthquakes and for the uh, uh, Real, Real Salt Lake, but they've proven to be you know to be competitive. Well, we'll see what happens next year with them. But if it stays the same, you know, uh, they stay competitive as well for next season, then that goes to show that it can be done. You know, we can have a competitive farm team, you know, in the USL that brings in players for uh, that are MLS ready, but it will be con- but consistently uh, stay competitive after you start. To, they start taking the MLS ready players. So, I mean, that's my take. That's my take on it. Uh, hopefully uh, this uh this this uh, thought process continues not only with uh, Bert Garcia and front office of CFR's business, but also up there in uh, in Houston Dynamo. And you know, hopefully, maybe you know they'll give more time uh, if it's not at uh, Dynamo, uh, a little bit more time here at RGB for Charlie Ward and for uh, 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 George Malky now that that they've returned you know from injury. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, I do have a question for you. Uh, I know I did touch up on it uh, before about um, Ro- uh, Robbie Sagal. What happened to him? I don't know. He was. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recap. He was. He was there um, against Phoenix. So he's still on the team. Um, I think. I don't know. Now, now that now that you mentioned that, I'm. I'm questioning my own memory if he was there or not. I don't know if it was just a situation of they put him out there and they were, you know, so convinced that he, you know, wasn't a center back that they wanted out there again. I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, you have a relatively decent, you know, center back tandem of, you know, Ivan and um, whether it's Taylor Hunter or, or somebody else. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you have Bill U. And now you have Ontiveros, which has, who has uh, actually looked really good out there whenever he whenever he's he, played. He has, yeah, he's been a difference maker as well. So yeah, I don't know if it was just a situation of they didn't like what they saw and they felt they had the numbers not to play him anymore. Mm-hmm. So yeah, because he was my knowledge. My knowledge is still on the team. Yeah, because he actually was. Uh, you were right. He was uh, Robbie Sagal was actually on the bench against uh, Phoenix Rising uh, last time. Um, but you know, frankly, I think. Um, and I'll and I'll ask you this uh, a little bit before we before we uh, sign off for this episode of uh, Down in the Valley. But I think if you ask me, he's got to have to be one of the one of the players, if the only player that ha- that has got that I feel has got to go, because he shows he's showed whenever he's played, especially against Sacramento. And I keep on going back to that Sacramento game, that horrible Sacramento game. How he showed no heart, no hustle. You know, to get back and defend, <laughs> he's he's my he's like I said, he's he's one of the players that I just don't want him on the team, he, because he does not he does not represent that crest, you know, in the manner that that should be rep- uh, represented. I mean, you're playing you're playing for that that crest that's on that's on your shirt, and that is not a dignified way how he had been playing. It's not a very dignified way uh, to show to show that to show that love to show that respect. To the region that you're playing for. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that he was there. Otherwise, it was been some huge random white guy that I saw that wasn't him. But so I'm glad he actually was there. But see, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not positive. I mean, and honestly, you know, fit and system sometimes is everything in soccer. I'm not saying it is in his circumstance, but mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe this just ended up not being the right right spot for him. Honestly, I'll, I'll make a bold prediction. He's from Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, you know, the Las Vegas Lights are coming into the USL next year. Yeah. I would be surprised, actually, if you didn't end up out here. I mean, you're playing in front of you know, your family and friends. So um, he, he's got the size. I think he has the talent. He just, like you said, he kind of was getting twisted all around in that Sacramento match and a couple of the matches he appeared in. So, yeah, I wouldn't, if I, if I had to predict somebody that will not be back next year, I would. Um, I, w- I would have to say it'll be Robbie, and you know, maybe he'll end up out here uh, next year with the with the lights. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so um, speaking of the lights, so what have you heard? What have you heard any news? I know it's not Toros related, but it is USL related. Have you heard any news on uh, the Las Vegas lights? No, uh, actually, yeah. So, not as far as personnel or anything like that. 
actually they just hired a good friend of mine as their communications director, so they got a um, good one there and, and their owner. I, I made sure to mention him. He made a good hire, but mm -hmm. um, in stadium news, nobody wants a dual sports stadium. Um, I know there are teams in the USL that go with that model. Reno is one of them. Yeah. Um, Las Vegas, at least for next season. We'll be sharing Cashman Field with Las Vegas 51s, which are a AAA team. Mm -hmm. There was actually an announcement this week that the 51s will be moving to a different part of town. So, like FC will actually take over Cashman Field fully. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's great. You know, it's another soccer specific stadium. Um, their owner, Brent Lashbrook, was already telling me of his plans to, on match days, alter it from a baseball stadium to a soccer field. Mm -hmm. And so now they're not going to have to do that after next year, which is great. Um, from when I talked to him, they're not going to make any personnel moves until after the USL season ends. Obviously, a lot of the guys you're looking for, player or manager-wise, are, are tied up now. So um, I think once the season ends, you'll, you'll see a lot of movement as far as them getting the general manager and manager and then filling out their roster. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I'm actually, I'm actually proud uh, for, for Las Vegas that they, they'll have they'll have a usl team because uh starting i mean starting this year you started having a lot of a lot of professional teams moving to las vegas you have the raiders uh you have uh, you know las vegas lights um i believe you also, you also have an nhl team if i'm not mistaken yeah the, the, the golden knights they actually lost their their first game last night they started off with three and now i think mm-hmm yeah, they, and then I also heard there's a WNBA team possibly moving out here from San Antonio, I think. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. It's, uh, so they'll have a lot more. They'll have a lot more to do in Las Vegas than just going to the casinos. That's actually that's actually pretty good. No dis, no dis to yeah, Las Vegas, obviously. <laughs> but for uh, sure, no, of course not. <laughs> but uh, so let so let me just go ahead and, and kind of go over uh, what's gonna what's gonna be happening for this last week. Uh, uh, in the USL. So on Thursday, um, we had Orlando City B lose against the Tampa Bay Rowdies. They lost against them uh, two to zero. And then uh, yesterday night, yesterday at Thunderbird Stadium, we had uh, Vancouver Whitecaps FC two lose against Orange County FC four to three. And then so the games for today, uh, Saturday, October fourteenth, you have the Rochester Rhinos playing against uh, New York Red Bulls two. You'll have uh, Charlotte Independence against the Charleston Battery. Pittsburgh River Hounds against Ottawa Fury. Uh, that's where that's where uh, my boy Callum Irving is playing now. Yeah, my guy. <laughs> yep, yeah, I miss him. I still miss him, even though we have Callie Brown and uh, and DeBoer Hangotia. But he was just he was just pretty pretty good guy to talk to. Absolutely. Uh, so then you have uh, Louisville City FC uh, playing against uh, Richmond Kickers, and uh, Toronto FC two against FC Cincinnati. Uh, all those games are at 6.30, uh, the Louisville and the Cincy games. At 7 o'clock at One Oak, uh, One Oak Field, you'll have uh, Tulsa Roughnecks against Colorado Springs Switchbacks. And then at 7.30, the game we all, we're all are, is waiting, San Antonio FC against Rio Grande Valley FC. At 8 at Rio Tinto Stadium, you'll have Real Monarchs SLC, who, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they, they won the uh, regular season championship, correct? Yeah, they were, yeah they won the USL regular season title. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so uh, just a quick question on that. So you have a regular season champion and a playoffs champion. Is that so? There's two champions in every USL season, or how does that work? Yeah, I, I think the regular season one is almost the formality of hey, you have the best record. Um, mm -hmm. I think they do get a trophy, but um, I don't. If you look back, I don't think if you look back like last year. I actually, no matter of fact, last year the Red Bulls won both of them. But, yeah. Um, I think you look back; it's just the champ, the actual champions who wins in the playoffs, wins the USL Cup final. But uh, yeah, Real Monarchs actually, and then one of the games you mentioned, uh, Charlotte Independence and Charleston Battery. That that's one that sticks out. Should be a good match. Um, both playoff teams. Uh, Romario Williams is one of the top scorers for um, the USL. He plays for Charleston, and Charlotte's great as well. They have the uh, runner-up in the Golden Boot right now, Enzo Martinez. And then Dan Kelly uh, for Reno, mm -hmm. actually a former uh, Charleston Battery man himself and a good friend of mine. is He's leading the Golden Boot, so hopefully he'll you know, bring it home. He got his first cap with the Reggae Boys this year, too. So, uh, yeah, good, nice little, nice little wrap-up weekend for the USL regular season, and we get into the playoffs where, as we saw last year, anything can happen. 
Yeah. Uh, so, like I said, Real Monarchs uh, SLC will be playing against LA Galaxy 2. You'll have Reno 1868, uh, where Dane Kelly is. They'll be playing against Sacramento Republic FC. That one's gonna that's gonna be an interesting game right there. There's gonna be some. I, I almost I'll I'll be willing to bet that that game does not end scoreless. <laughs> oh oh no, they, they, you have one of the best attackers uh, there, and then you'll have you'll have uh, in Sacramento Republic, you'll have uh, what's his name? He he plays he played uh, a couple of minutes against uh, against the USA with Trinidad. Uh, Trevin season Trevin Cesar yeah well he's the, he's the one that that, that uh, had the uh, the Toros defense uh crazy that that six two that six two match yeah that was him Trevin yeah, Caesar. That, that he did yeah so then at 9 30 p.m you'll have Phoenix Rising FC against Portland Timbers 2 I think it's gonna be an easy match for Phoenix Rising uh just yeah. how things have been going on with the timber Timbers 2 and then on Sunday at 2 p.m., you'll have Bethlehem, Bethlehem Steel FC. They'll play against St. Louis FC. And then the last game of the regular season for the whole USL, at 5 p.m. at Taft Stadium, you'll have OKC Energy against Seattle Sounders FC 2. And I believe that OKC match, um, it is the last match, and it also will partially impact um, the playoff matchups. OKC is in, for mm-hmm. sure. Um, I think actually both conferences, I think think are set pretty much but uh depending on how the okc match goes that'll affect uh, who san antonio matches up with and who some of the other teams match up with so Mm -hmm. um yeah it's gonna be i I think we can call it like seeding saturday or seeding saturday and sunday something like that because there definitely is some some moving parts for sure all right so i think wait is this one for, for this oh no this was for 2016 anyway so Having having gone through all of all of these uh, these uh, matches, and I'm pretty sure you've seen what the standings uh, are currently for both the Eastern and the Western Conference. Do you dare to name a champion already? Man, I don't know. I, I'll say this: I I'm not I'm not overly confident on Real Monarchs. Um, I know they won the regular season title, but um, they had Chandler Hoffman. But to me, they're they're just okay. Um, honestly, I think I think Reno could do some damage. Um, they scored the most goals across the USL. Um, their goal differential was like thirty six. The next highest was like in the twenties. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I if I had to name a champion, I would say Charleston could do it. Charleston could be a team that does it. Um, New York Red Bulls do won it last year, and so I know they'll be dangerous again. Mm-hmm. Honestly, and, and I hate to say it, but San Antonio FC is, they're really good defensively. And if you're really good defensively, you, you always have a chance to win. Um, Sebastian Ibiaga should win the Defensive Player of the Year mm-hmm. in the USL pretty easily. Uh, for, former Houston Animal guy, uh, former Toro as well. Um, if he doesn't, there's something, in my opinion, wrong with the voting or wrong with the <laughs> analysis of how they, how they determine that, but. Um, yeah, they're real good defensively. So San Antonio could do it, and then you have a guy like Billy Forbes at the other end um, that's able to score some goals. So I would say a favorite from each conference, I'll go with Reno and Charleston in the East. Yeah, I've, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to uh, agree with you. Uh, if anything, I'd probably if it's not Charleston, I would probably say the Rowdies. For the Eastern Conference, yeah, yeah, and, and I, this is their first USL season too. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, they've been in the NASL for a while, and that that league's a you know poop show, for lack of a better term. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay is good. They have a lot of um, veterans. They're probably one of the older teams as far as their key players across the USL. So uh, yeah, that could be a team where you see them get into the playoffs and see you know experience take over. Um, I have my personal sadness is they don't have Freddie Adu anymore. Uh, he played there, you know, I think it was a couple of years. That, that's my guy, but, yeah, they don't have him anymore. But, uh, yeah, Tim Bay, that's not a bad pick. Yeah. I do have to I do have to, to say, you know, about, you know, you mentioned about uh, San Antonio being really good defensively. I mean, they not only have Sebastian uh, Ibeaga, but they also have uh, Restrepo in the, uh, in the goalkeeper position. He's a really good keeper. And to think, yeah, I believe he was brought actually, to be a third, a third keeper. Yeah, I was going to say, and he, he wasn't even supposed to be the starter and then have a season. He's, he's leading the USL uh, clean sheets, to my knowledge, here. 
that's pretty ridiculous when your backup keeper is that good. Yeah, I mean, because I, I, I'm not mistaken, it was the the starter was going to be um, Cardone. Car- Car- yeah, the guy with the beard. Yeah, he, and and Diego weird. and Diego Diego Restrepo right now is actually leading uh, the race to the Golden Glove. He's got 12 clean sheets uh, on his record. Uh, followed by Tomas Gomez, who has 11 from the Rochester Rhinos. So those two, they're going to be, they're going to be, if anything, I think Diego Restrepo has already got this in the bag, unless uh, unless Tomas Gomez earns, uh, earns earns a shutout, you know, because I don't I don't think there's going to be a shutout uh, uh, against uh, RGBFC. Um, so yeah, if I'll, anything, I'll... if anything, they'll they'll probably they'll probably tie for for the for the golden uh, the golden glove. But you know, other other than that, you know, I just I feel that Diego Restrepo is going to take it. And, I mean, good for him. I know he's a San, he's a San, San Antonio player, but you you gotta you gotta give props, you know, to a player who has done things, uh, who has done his job correctly. No matter even if he's from the from the rival team, you know, you gotta analyze this, you know, as objectively as possible. And you you know that Diego Restrepo is, is a really really good keeper. Yeah, and more power to him because he doesn't look like a professional soccer player at all. <laughs> in my opinion, and coming from a from a husky guy myself, uh, he's a. I think Gordito is an understatement. Which was so he looks kind of like a little bowling ball. But yeah, he, he's quick. And actually, you can see on the uh, Escalante goal, he his reflexes are quick. That time they didn't get back there in time. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he's a good keeper, and like you said, you know. Real respect's real, as they say, and hence why, you know, fully endorse Ibiaga, you know, win Defensive Player of the Year. So, uh, yeah, you got you got to tip your cap to those those that are great, that's for sure. Whether they, you know, wear the Toros kit, which we we like, or you know, San Antonio, which you know we don't like as much. All right. So I guess this pretty much uh, concludes our special edition of Down in the Valley. Uh, hopefully we get we can have some more uh, shows like shows like these, especially uh, during the next season. Uh, I know you 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 did mention you did mention to me and, and the guys uh, up there in, in Houston agree that uh, you know ten minutes just isn't enough more more uh, more often than not you know to talk about everything that's going on here in the valley. I mean we've already this, we're we're at the we're at the end of the season and this show. Has already gone for a little bit more than an hour, so you know that that goes to show you know that that yes we we are a USL team, but there's still a lot of stuff to to talk about about this team. Yeah, so. and, and what unless the Toros like get the shit kicked out of them, then mm-hmm. I'll talk for ten minutes. But uh, yeah, other than that, I'm definitely chill. Like after Sacramento, like I didn't want to talk much, but uh, typically, typically, yeah, ten minutes is not enough to cover it. Yeah. So uh Carson, so where can where can the where can they find you? Yeah, they can find me at Carson A. Merck uh on Twitter and then tonight for the South Texas Derby I'm going to be live tweeting from uh, the official Dynamo Theory at Dynamo Theory uh, account. Like I said earlier, expect pretty decent analysis but you know, especially strong in the in the uh the gift department and then also um, Texas Soccer Journal also mentioned that um, they'll be down there um, live tweeting that match. So I'll try to retweet some of theirs and obviously get some of my own thoughts. So um, we will have you covered tonight. That much is for sure. All right. And uh, and also you can follow uh, The Peel at uh, on Twitter at The Peel 05. You can uh, follow on Facebook at uh, The Peel 2005. You can follow us uh, as well uh, on our YouTube on our official YouTube channel. Uh, we do also have SoundCloud. We have, we're, and you can find our podcasts as well uh, on uh, Apple Music as well as uh, Google Play Store. Uh, and you can also follow uh, Down in the Valley on Twitter. Uh, just uh, it's at Down in the RGV. So we'll try to see how much information we can get you all during during the off season. I know uh, you'll probably have uh, the occasional articles. Uh, for uh, the bull and its horns on uh, Dynamo Theory during the off season, is that correct? Yeah, I'll definitely have uh, a recap, obviously, for this match, and I'll have a lengthy recap of not only the season but kind of the player breakdowns. And yeah, throughout the off season, I, you know, as news breaks, I usually knock out a quick article, and then also, um, you know, catch up with some of the players, some player profiles as well. 
All right. So I guess this this concludes this uh, episode of Down in the Valley. Uh, Carson, thank you, thank you so much for uh, taking taking this call uh, for us. You know, you're you're our main member here here at uh, at Down in the Valley. So hope hopefully we can uh, uh, we can have a better season next year, and we'll be here. Uh, you know it. You you will be here to to cover the the Toros as much as we can. Uh, so that way, hopefully, people not only in the RGV but you know in Houston as well, they they can pay it uh, pay attention to what's coming down on uh, coming down the pipeline per se, uh, for the Houston Dynamo. So um, absolutely, we are Toros, somos Toros. Claro que sí. Uh, so so we'll see you next time. Uh, like I said, th thank you so much, Carson, and. Uh, ho um, We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, tonight against San Antonio, and hopefully next year. Good, should be a good one. And hopefully next year we can actually have a supporters uh, section uh, t trophies to kind of like uh, uh, El Capitan with uh, FC Dallas and Houston Dynamo. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, uh, take care, uh, Carson. And we'll, uh, hopefully right, we'll boss. talk uh, next week. All right. Goodbye. All right, so so that's it for for t uh, today's episode of uh, RGV. Um, so what what's gonna hold uh, for the future of uh, down in the valley? As you know, we're out of the playoffs, so uh, there's not gonna be much uh, to uh, happening with with the with the peel as far as down the valley. Um, however, we do I can do a little bit of, of coverage on Liga Liga MX. Uh, so I'll go ahead. I can go ahead and do that, do that as well. Like I mentioned uh, during the the podcast, there's a lot of Liga MX fans here in, here in the valley, and so I can uh, I can go ahead and, and and offer that service as well. You know, to as far as uh, coverage of Liga MX teams, uh, we are gonna have on uh, November eighth, if I'm not mistaken. Let me check that uh, right away. But Tigres. Tigres is going to be coming to HEB Park in a friendly against uh, Club uh, Veracruz. It's going to be on Wednesday, November 8th uh, at 7 p.m. Like I said, at HEB Park in Edinburgh Stadium. Tigres, UA, uh, Tigres Universidad Otomán de Nuevo León, they're going to be playing against Tiburones Rojos Veracruz. There is a little bit of uh, history between these two teams. Uh, last season, uh, during one of the regular season uh, games, there, there, was a bit, uh, there was a bit of... Uh, uh, of a clash between uh, between uh, supporters groups of both of both teams, and so uh, there's there is a bit of a heated rivalry, not official rivalry, but there is a little bit of a heated rivalry uh, between the the fan bases of, of both teams. Uh, however, you do have uh, in uh, a couple of uh, ex Tigres in in uh, Tiburones Rojos Veracruz. Uh, more notably, you have uh, Jose Rivas. Who is an ex, uh, who is an ex tigre? Uh, el, we dubbed him el, el Incha que juega, because he always, always Jose Rivas always put his heart out for Tigres. You know, sadly he he was loaned over there because of how many uh, players have been brought in in, uh, in that position. You do have Francisco Mesa, you do have um, uh, Colo as well recently, Juninho, Ugayala. You know, so they needed some some fresh blood, you know, to continue the next generation of Tigres. So hopefully, Valley people, um, even if you're not a fan of either of these two teams, I uh, really would suggest you know going. I guess it is it's it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing at all. Uh, so go buy uh, buy your tickets to go see the, to go see this Liga MX uh, uh, game. Like I mentioned, I'll repeat it. It's on November eighth. At 7 p.m. So um, until next time, this has been Edson Ochoa and we had Carson Merck as well um, for Down in the Valley. Take care and we'll see each other on the next episode. Goodbye.
guys, what's up? It's Kyle Murphy, and you're listening to uh, Down in the Valley with Appeal.